Greetings everyone. Lebanon has sunk in a dire economic and financial crisis for more than three years now. The situation has been aggravated by a deep political deadlock leading to a continuous parliamentary failure to elect a new president. Amid all this chaotic scene, the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs, Mrs. Barbara Lisp, is visiting Lebanon. And she's our guest in this fireside talk conducted by the Meshedia Foundation Media Institute under the project Renewing Lebanon's Political and Economic Structures in partnership with the Public Diplomacy Section at the U.S. Embassy in Beirut. Mrs. Leaf, welcome to Lebanon and thank you for being here with us. Thank you very much, Joelle. I'm honored to be on the program. Me too. Let's talk about your visit. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about its purpose? So, look, I have been wanting to get to Lebanon for several months now. And I took the opportunity as I was making a regional tour uh, to come by Lebanon and to uh, touch base with some of the key leaders here. Uh, Lebanon's at a crossroads and it's at a, a very critical moment. And I thought it was important to both hear directly from some of the leadership, but also to convey Washington's own message. Can we, know, can we know about um, the U.S. position regarding the Lebanese presidential election? This is crucial here in Lebanon. We heard some rumors uh, spread by pro-Iranian parties in Lebanon mentioning that uh, you would be okay with dealing with Sleiman Frangi as a potential president. Is that true? And if yes, does that mean that the United States has a preferred candidate? Absolutely not. We do not have a candidate. We do not have a vote in this, in this particular process. The mandate for selecting the next president was provided by the people of Lebanon to their elected representatives in the parliament. Now, unfortunately, until now, five months after President Aoun stepped down, uh, you still don't have a president. And not having a president means you don't have a fully empowered prime minister and a fully empowered, empowered cabinet. The whole process is locked, uh, but it is not for the U.S. to unlock it. Rather, it is for Lebanon's own elected re representatives to do so, and to do so with urgency. We also heard that there is probably a disagreement between the USA and France regarding Lebanon. How true is that? No, we talk regularly with, with our French colleagues, with uh, many other countries, because we all share a common preoccupation with the crisis that, are, that Lebanon is going through. Um, and we talk frankly with our, our French friends. Um, and uh, again, it's not for France, it's not for the U.S. To, to do the job here. It's rather for the parliament to do its job. And thus far, they have not. Today, you've met the Lebanese officials. Mm -hmm. What did you tell them exactly? I tell them pretty much what I've just told you. Um, look, uh, the first thing I heard about when I arrived last night uh, was the readout, the press conference, uh, the readout uh, that the IMF team had given the government and had given a number of embassies around town and, and what they said publicly. And it was frankly not just sobering, it was, it was kind of frightening. Uh, the prognosis for Lebanon uh, a country which is already going through the severest of economic crises. The prognosis is, as the head of the team said, dangerous. And the danger is right ahead. It's stagflation, it's runaway inflation, it's job loss, it's surging unemployment. Worst of all, it's all the young talent of this country leaving. So uh, I can't tell you how critical it is now to unlock the path to a presidential election and therefore an empowered government that will take, undertake these reforms. There is no time left. So that was my message to all of Lebanon's leaders. But they haven't been feeling the urge to elect a president. Do you think that now, after they talk to you, they will be convinced? Well, I certainly hope I, uh, my message made an impact, but I think the IMF's very stark message should have made an impact. I frankly don't understand the lack of urgency uh, that apparently mem many political leaders and members of parliament, uh, that they don't feel. They don't feel a sense of urgency about this. And it is strange. 
Perhaps they would be frightened whenever you mention sanctions. For instance, like recently, we heard that there would be possible sanctions against Lebanese elites regarding the election. Can we dig into that? Like when, how, and against whom these sanctions will be imposed? Well, you know, Joël, as a, as a practical matter, my government doesn't, use, doesn't preview uh, steps that it might take uh, as it deliberates among the tools that we use to uh, urge people and, and get uh, governments to do what they ought to be doing. Um, but I can think of no greater sanction than the collapse of the state and the responsibility that these members of parliament and these political leaders will have to bear for such a thing. And a collapse of, a st of the state is not a theoretical possibility, it's a real possibility. In November, actually, you mentioned and you warned that all possibilities are open and you warned that Lebanon could face a real collapse and disintegration of the state, as well yes. as the collapse of the Lebanese for, uh, security forces. This is very dangerous. Why did you say that? Look, if I felt concerned last fall when I, when I made those remarks, I feel an even sharper sense of anxiety on behalf of Lebanon, on behalf of the Lebanese people, because all the indicators are just going downhill and in a very stark fashion. The collapse of the currency, uh, the lack of foreign reserves, um, the out, outward migration of, of the youth of this country, this will have a long-term effect. So all of the indicators are going sharply downward and at an accelerating speed. So this will have an impact, it already has had an impact on the Lebanese armed forces, on the internal security forces. My government and other partner governments are doing what we can to offer short-term assistance that will help buttress state institutions. But we cannot do the job of the government itself, nor of the people's parliament. But is it already too late, or do you think that it is still possible to improve Lebanon's economic situation regardless of the election? Absolutely, it's not too late. It is absolutely not too late. And the IMF has made clear that if the government, joined by the parliament, will move the country through a series of economic reforms, the IMF will be prepared to support it with a, a critical set of loans. But none of this can happen if the parliament doesn't do its job. But Mrs. Leaf, let's be realistic. Today, you met the same Lebanese leaders who led this country to its demise. Do you think that people who led the country to its collapse can find the solution to the crisis that they have caused? Look, uh, sometimes it takes a terrible crisis to focus people's minds, to focus people on the fact that there are no alternatives left. I simply can't understand why uh, the members of the parliament have not sat down and worked out a set of compromises on a candidate, why they have not formed a set of blocks that will empower one candidate to move forward. Uh, they haven't had any elections even since January. So something's missing here. Definitely. I do hope that we will end up uh, finding the light at the end of the tunnel, as I do too. we say. You were in Egypt and Jordan before yes. coming to Lebanon. Can we talk about the status of the energy deals with Egypt and Jordan? Well, look, um, after a period of time that, frankly, in our, in our uh, minds was a bit too long, uh, the government has done a series of significant steps uh, towards meeting the requirements of the World Bank. So I'm increasingly optimistic. Uh, that uh, the World Bank will be able to make its decision. And then the last step of this process will be uh, a careful scrutiny of the deal, the details of the deal, uh, by the U.S. Department of Treasury. But look, I, I think it's a, a terrific approach, regional partners proffering a solution to Lebanon's problems, energy problems. And it's, it, if it's realized, it will, of course, mean more uh, hours of electricity a day, which is critical not just for daily life, it's for businesses, for hospitals, and so on. 
but it will be cleaner, cheaper, uh, more durable, more sustainable. And behind that is yet another energy deal uh, that would also provide uh, further electricity for the grid. So I think, again, it's a matter of just pushing through and doing these final pieces. And I hope to hear good news soon. Hope so. Yeah. Let's talk about the region now. Recently, we've seen a lot of geopolitical changes in the Middle East. Uh, on the one hand, we have China's mediation and the Iranian-Saudi reconciliation. On the other hand, we are seeing efforts done by Arab nations in order to renew ties with Damascus. How does the United States perceive this, these big diplomatic shifts in the region? So as far as this news of the what I would call detente, um, an agreement that provides detente, a relaxation of tensions between uh, Riyadh and Tehran, look, anything that will de-escalate tensions in this very pressurized region, my government supports. We had discussions in the Biden administration in the first weeks uh, uh, after taking office with the Saudi government. And they were very clear, the leadership, that they thought that one avenue they should consider doing was opening up a diplomatic channel with Tehran, something they had not had for years. We absolutely endorse that because after all, you don't do diplomatic channels, channels of communication, just with your friends. It's, it's as important, if not more important, to have such channels with your adversaries. So it's been a two-year process, more than two years now, that the Saudis have had uh, a series of discussions that didn't bear fruit uh, with the Iranians, hosted by the Iraqis and then hosted by the Omanis. Um, things came together, perhaps because Iran finds itself under such extreme pressure, isolated, um, with great difficulty at home, uh, with its own public, um, facing great economic difficulties. A collection of factors brought it uh, to those talks. And on the other hand, I think the Saudis uh, got what they have been seeking from the Iranians for two years now, which is an agreement to back out of interfering and undermining uh, their security. Um, and a cessation of their support to non-state actors, lethal support to non-state actors like the Houthi, who have uh, attacked the kingdom over and over again. So I think it's a, I think it's actually a very positive move for the region in in a very fundamental sense. Now, as to uh, excuse me, will it affect Lebanon? You think? Well, I think that's. Uh, I think it should eventually have. A, a positive effect if it's realized, if in, if in fact Iran <clears throat> abides by its commitments, it will certainly have a calming effect on this region because so many countries have suffered at the hands of, of uh, Iran's destructive activities, its interference in domestic affairs, its predatory behavior. So it could certainly eventually have a positive effect here too. I just think in the first instance where we'll hopefully see an impact will be in Yemen. As to your other question about Syria, so look, um, let me just reaffirm something. My government is not going to normalize relations with Bashar al-Assad. Um, he has a long and, and, and very bloody history, uh, and he has uh, half destroyed or more than half destroyed his country in, in the most brutal fashion. There are a whole series of requirements uh, that under UN Security Council or Resolution 2254 that he has simply never met and he simply never made any attempt to meet. As to the sovereign decisions by other countries in this region, those are sovereign decisions. Uh, they are looking to their national interests. Uh, I respect that. I would just hope to see, and we've certainly advised our friends and partners in the region, that they should get something in return for this engagement with Assad. And they should get something in two directions. One, I think it's good to press him on these issues as relates to the security of his own people, uh, that he create the conditions to permit IDPs and refugees to return home in, in safety and security. And by doing so, he will also be lightening 
the load on some of his neighbors who are struggling uh, to remain good hosts to, to refugees. And on the other hand, something that else that uh, the regime has fostered that brings great insecurity to the region is the Captagon trade. So I would hope that any of these partner countries, of friends of ours, who are looking at engaging with Assad, that they will get something very specific in return. Thank you, Mrs. Leaf, for this interview. And we also like to thank MCF Media Institute and the Public uh, Diplomacy Affairs at the US Embassy in Beirut for organizing this project. And last but not least, thank you all for watching.